can't believe I'm going to tell you this story, but I suppose it's historic for a number of reasons. Um, in that, it, well, it's it was my first character that I can remember. It had to be my first character. Um, and also uh, the first character death. That happened rather, ooh, probably about a month in. But all things considered, it happened pretty quickly. Uh, or maybe it was lucky I slept, survived this long. But um, my brother, my older brother, was DMing at the time. Um, I was probably around 10. Arguably too young to induct somebody into the cult of D&D. Especially, again, since um, the covers looked like this. Yeah. Um, my parents did not yet fully understand D&D. Uh, anyway... Um, yeah, my character, he went out, uh, impressively, uh, that's about the word I can use to describe it. Um, again, I have to preface most of what's going to happen in this story with the fact that I was, like, ten. And it was my first game. Uh, and in the interest of fairness, it is about how I failed catastrophically. Uh, let it be said, I do not blame my older brother for this. Uh, he was fair. He was a hard ass, but he was fair. And I try to emulate that when I can. But he was only doing what the book said. I am really, like, I'm already, like, apologizing, like, five minutes in advance of the story. So I think I ought to just tell you the story and then tell you what actually happened. Because it's weird. <sighs> I was ten. Okay, so um, I decided to keep things simple. My brother encouraged me to keep things simple. So my first character was a human fighter. Fair enough. They have pretty much one answer to everything. And that was pretty much all I wanted to do anyway. So, fair enough. And I... I gave the character a name. In hindsight, it was ten. Um, I, 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 was, I was good enough not to just steal names from, like, Lord of the Rings. I've had players, young players... This is nothing against them. They come up with the first thing that comes to mind. They bring me a character named Strider. Uh, I don't make fun of them. I'm just like, eh, could we like maybe get a little more original than Strider? I specifically did not go with any kind of Lord of the Rings character. Um, I decided to kind of emulate some of the heroes that uh, I'd seen in the books, like some of the examples. Um, fairly stereo, you know, fairly stereotypical do-gooder fighter names because I want to play a good guy. Um, and so I believe, yeah, I've been reading Dragonlance as well. I love Dragonlance. And one of the, 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 one of the characters I really liked was called Sturm Brightblade. So very, uh, looking back on it, he's a very typical name and you can kind of make any heroic fighter slash paladin name if you just kind of choose a badass first name and then kind of cram together two words of really cool things or really dark things, really violent things. So like bright blade, it implies that he's a good guy and he's a blade. Um, uh, so like Dirk, the, you know, not actually not Dirk, the, uh, like uh, Dirk ever sharp or I, I, I don't know. stuff like uh, um, uh, uh, Richard Lionheart, something like that. That was an actual guy, Richard the Lionheart. But you know what I mean? So like you have a fighter, um, Slab Awesome Fist. It's, uh, you know, Slab Flame Fist. Um, dwarven characters are very easy in this regard. You just kind of tack hammer on any of them. So you have, like, Grunt, Tack, Hammer. What is he? He's a smith. All dwarves are smith. That's racist. I'm sorry. Um, so Blake, Blake Strong Iron. Things. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you what I named mine. Um <sighs> My character's name was Lance Storm Shield. Lance Storm Shield. I didn't know. I mean, if I can be serious for a minute, I, I didn't watch WCW back in the day. I didn't know Lance Storm was a guy. Lance Storm Shield is not a guy, but I still call my character Lance Storm. And I did not, in fact, give him a Canadian accent. Um, but yeah, Lance Storm Shield. Um, to be fair, my older brother, nobody else at the table watched WCW either, but in hindsight, I was 10. 
You're gonna make fun of me forever about that one now. Fuck. <sighs> He's a pretty good character. As far as he didn't last very long, but you know. So what happens is fairly standard dungeon crawl. Uh, Doug liked to... That's my brother's name, Doug. Not Doug Walker, but a Doug. Um, he liked to start us off very simple, as do I, with usually a published module or something like that. So um, I'm not sure if it was Under Mountain. Uh, Under Mountain might have been a more recent publication than the version I was playing, but it was essentially like Under Mountain, where um, there's a tavern built over the entrance to this very strange dungeon. And so the guy charges admission essentially to, and also it's strange. So, but it's a very dangerous place uh, and run according to local folklore by a very powerful uh, wizard from the days of yore, who is now, who is now, you know, like in torpor or, uh, you know, forever sleep if he's not dead already, you know, and any adventurers brave and bold enough to get to the bottom could loot his, uh, loot his tomb or crypt or cavern or study or whatever of all the stuff and get out. So it could have been BS. It could have been real. So that, but this guy built a tavern on top of it and sealed it up. So no, nothing could get out. But, you know, our characters went in there to seek their fortune. It was really no more complicated than that. We were seeking our fortune and killing things. Hey, it was, it was 10. It's, um, it's simple enough. I can handle that. So what happens is we're questing for about a week. We get past the first level. We're going down there. And then we run into almost like um, a very, a very humid type of area. And we're figured like, there's a lot of condensation down here. This must be, you know, this, this must be some, there, and we, we find an underground lake, okay? And it's also, there's a lot of moss and a lot of undergrowth. Um, and so there's a lot of strange things. Like we see giant bugs, like a giant tick. I believe giant tick is actually in the, it's probably in the core book, which is why he used it. But he, you know, we were fighting a lot of gigantic fucking ticks the size of dogs. It was really cool. Um, I usually, I usually argue against fighting vermin, but when they're really awesome like that, like a giant tick that would scare the shit out of you. And, you know, giant spider would scare the piss out of me, but spiders are kind of typical. So my brother, at least, was coming up with, like, new and original vermin to throw at us. So it wasn't giant rats. He was throwing, what it, what was it? Um, uh, oh, fuck. Uh, he threw, yeah, he threw, uh, like, sewer crocodiles. That's cool. Um, so... Uh, an Oteog. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but an Oteog is almost literally like a shit, an, uh, a trash monster. It's like, imagine Pizza the Hut, but he's made out of used condoms and and shit and uh, Chinese takeout containers, and they smell horrible. So that's, we were fighting stuff like that. And then we run into um, giant snakes, giant poisonous snakes. And so naturally we get jumped by giant cobras. I never said the ecology of this dungeon made much sense, but we got attacked by giant cobras. Um, it's a tough fight, but you know we we saw we saw treasure glinting at the bottom of this lake, and we were gonna get it by God. And we had to get past the giant barracudas in the lake. For, well, at first we had the fucking cobras. Okay, so we're fighting the cobras, and naturally I'm getting bit like crazy. So I drink uh I drink a cure poison potion because we had one. So I drink my Cure Poison Potion, and the next round, or the next round after that, we finish off all the Cobras, and I'm beat to shit. I don't have many hit points left, because when you start off, you don't have any hit points anyway. So uh, I'm, I've am i been bit up, I cured my poison, but I decided, wow, that sucked. Um, so I, uh, I, I drink my Cure Light Wounds Potion, and then my character explodes. Yeah. I, he, he drank a potion and he exploded. <clears throat> Thus ended the tale of uh, Lance Storm Shield. That's it. Why did that happen? I'm glad you asked. Well, this is actually one of my favorite rules. Um, in hindsight, uh, 
And it's good so long as everyone is aware that it exists. In fact, I highly recommend doing this, having your character spontaneously combust. I mean, it happens all the time, hundreds of times a year, but it's not really widely reported. Um, but no, it's not spontaneous human combustion. Um, what happened was potion missability. You have no idea what that is, most likely, but it's a thing. And it was a thing that was phased out quickly in uh, basically it was this is like first edition AD and D, I believe. It was phased the fuck out out of every single version past this, which I don't know why. I liked it. Um, I guess they decided to be more merciful. But yeah, this was the the uh, the demon cover AD and D um, when when men were men and women were women and giant cobras were giant cobras and you drank a cure light wounds potion and sometimes you'd explode. I'm dancing around the issue. The issue is potion missability. What does that mean? It means mixing potions. Okay, so here's the here's the reasoning behind it. Imagine, if you will, any movie or even wizards in wizards in uh, you know fiction. Usually, what do you imagine them doing other than getting their ass kicked? Um, usually you figure them pouring over, you know, scribing things down or reading books, like really, really big books, or they're in their laboratory. And what are they doing? They're making potions, which is actually a very common occurrence in newer editions of Dungeons and Dragons. But how do those potions get made? It's, it's an interesting question, but this version of D&D &D kind of went into detail on that one in the sense that Again, uh, kind of a, a stereotype or cliche when it comes to uh, wizards, more bumbling wizards, really, that you see in fiction or read in fiction. What happens when they get distracted or they're absent minded and they do something stupid in their laboratory or they, you know, they're like, what happens when you mix an acid in the base and the potion explodes in their face? And it's all, you know, their face is all, you know, covered in soot. And you're like, oh, oh, you know, oh, oh he, but that was funny. <laughs> well, that sort of stuff can happen in this version. Because when you're mixing potions, it's not just alchemy. It's not just acids and bases. We are talking complex, fundamental forces of arcane technologies, strange chemicals made of things like Medusa blood, uh, you know, the s scale of a dragon, the brain fluid of a mind flare, a crow's feather, basically all those things like when you mix a potion in Skyrim, imagine all that. But in this case, things can go wrong, like in a movie or like in the story where the bumbling wizard mixes some shit and things go bad. That's potion missability, which was phased out later. But here... There's a th there's rules for it. And what I did not know, and I probably would have done it anyway had I known, was uh, potion missability can take place not only when you're like in a laboratory and mixing, you know, potion here and goblet B with another potion. That's missability as well. But potion missability also occurs when you drink one potion too soon after another. Because the potions mix in your tummy. Bad things can happen that way. Now, well, I'll just, I have it tabbed, uh, but I've invested in a uh, little tab so I don't spend all day flipping uselessly through the book looking for that obscure rule. I'm sorry about that, by the way. But anyway, there is a table known as the potion, if it'll focus, the potion missability table. There's a lot of words there, so I'll sum up. I'm just going to read you the book. I know this is fascinating. Um, the magical mixture of compounds which comprise potions are not always compatible. No shit. You must test the missability of potions whenever, one, two potions are actually intermingled, or two, a potion is consumed by a creature while another such liquid already consumed is still in effect. Now, you could argue that, well, the cure, po the cure poison thing has already taken effect, but I drank this literally like 15 seconds after the first. So I actually don't grudge him this one, but still, fuck this rule. No. Um, it says, now your next question. Well, I'll just, I'll read the results here. Um, you roll a percentile dice, which has a result of one to a hundred. So 
Sometimes nothing will happen. Sometimes the potions aren't compatible at all, and nothing will happen. Sometimes one goes, you know, sometimes one works as it, as it should, and the other one is like half as effective. But good things can happen too. So because like sometimes in these stories, the wizard discovers some new formula, uh, something unexpected happens, but a good one. Uh, or sometimes they make some kind of super potion. So it's not really in, it's most of the time nothing will happen. The potions are missable that they mix together, no problem. In fact, the, the odds of this no problem be are, are 36 to 90. Pretty good. So, but every time you, you mix potions, you roll a D100 um, and you check the table. Most times nothing happens. Sometimes the potions are less effective or they neutralize each other. So 26 to 35, immiscible result, immiscible which causes both potions to be at half normal efficacy when consumed. So in this case, he might have decided that, well, if this had been if this had been the case, I would have gotten half hit points, and maybe it would have worked as a slow poison potion, or maybe I just would have taken a little bit of additional damage. I don't know, but usually this would occur if there was like in this case, for instance, uh, the the best analogy would be like if you drank a potion of bull strength and cat's grace and they both were in effect at the same time. You could argue that they aren't mixable, and both are at half efficiency. That's the sort of thing you can relate to in, in current terms. Um, the other, uh, 16 to 25 is immiscible. One potion canceled, but the other remains normal, and which one is canceled is random. Um, 9 to 15, immiscible. Both, po both potions totally destroyed as one neutralizes the other. Uh, four to eight, mild poison, which causes nausea and a loss of one point each of strength and dexterity for five to 20 rounds. No saving throw possible. One potion is canceled. The other is at half strength and duration. Now we're getting to the bad stuff. <laughs> if you roll a two or a three out of a hundred, so a 2% chance, lethal poison results and imbiber is dead. If externally mixed, as in mixed in bottles outside in the lab, uh, a poison gas cloud of 10 feet in diameter results, and all within it must save versus poison or die. And if you roll a one, essentially botching, 1% 1 out of 100, it says in capital letters, EXPLOSION! Internal damage is 6 to 60 hit points, those within a five foot radius take one to 10 hit points of damage. If mixed, if mixed externally, all within a 10 foot radius take four to 24 points, no save. My question, imagine I was a high level fighter with any number over than 60 really. If I had 70 hit points and I drank my two potions to buff up before combat and I rolled a one, Okay, there's an explosion. Um, so it says internal damage is six to 60 hit points. Those within a five foot radius take one to 10. Meaning I could conceivably survive this. Hell, my, my, my first level fighter could conceivably have survived this if I'd have rolled like a six. How? What? If there's an explosion in my gut of two mixed potions, how the fuck do you survive that? Especially considering, like, everyone within a five foot radius also takes damage. So I've exploded. But I'm okay. Like, I'm not okay, but like, is, is there just like this big, you could just see my ribs and my spine. Like everything out here is just gone but I'm alive. I guess so. You're like, could you tuck my guts back? <laughs> but my guts are gone. They exploded. So yeah, I mean, two and three is a lethal result, but it, it, one, you actually might live, even though you have internally detonated, injuring everyone else around you. That makes sense. No, it doesn't. That's potion missability. Now, that's bullshit, you say. It is. No, uh, but good things can happen, too. Not likely. 
but it's possible. 91 to 99. A compatible result which causes one potion, randomly determined, to have 150% normal efficacy. You must determine if both effect and duration are permissible, or if only the duration should be extended. So, a good thing can happen there. Or, if you roll 100, in caps, DISCOVERY! The admixture of the two potions has caused a special formula which will cause one of the two potions only to function, but its effects will be permanent upon the imbiber. Note that some harmful side effects could result from this. So, there's a 1% chance anytime you mix two potions that the effect is permanent, of one of them is permanent. So, here's an example. If you drank your potion of Cat's Grace and got three dexterity, and you drank your bull strength and got three points of strength, and you rolled a hundred, well, one of those potions could be permanent. So start chugging, motherfucker. You know. So, now, that's weird. It is. But, now your mind could start working on ways to take advantage of this. And it also explains, believe it or not, Potion miscibility explains why certain things are the way they are in, like, fantasy worlds. It explains some demigods. So imagine, for instance, if there's a... Probably a bad example, but, you know, the one of the gods of wanderers and bards is named Heward. What if he drank a, a potion that raised his charisma and something else, and it raised his charisma to, like, godlike proportions? Could be. Or... If somebody drank a potion of flying and that was given a permanent effect, wow, that's cool. So you can see how certain like certain monsters could potentially have come into being, like certain abominations or even a certain race of people could have come into being because of this. So if someone was, you know, transformed into something else as a result of one of these potions or something like that, it explains superpowers. You know, certain certain characters and demigods and things like that, or the ascension of certain people, well, it, it kind of makes sense. Because sometimes, like in a comic book, accidents happen. But they're good ones. It gives you powers. So, to me, this isn't really out of line with the way Dungeons & Dragons should work. One out of a hundred... Something epic happens. Didn't happen to me, goddammit. Or at least something epic in the sense that I fucking exploded. I took... I forget how much... I, I seriously took over 40, though. I had, like, 10. And that's at max. I think I was, like, 2. Jesus Christ. They like, scraping me off the fucking ceiling. I was 10. Come on, Doug. Come on! I didn't read that shit. It, it was pretty funny. No, it was... And, well, the thing is, that only happened once, you know. So, I actually do not... But you're all going to tell me how much of a dick my brother was? I don't think so. Because, honestly, he gave me plenty of time to read the books, and I was a big-time reader. So, he gave me this book, I didn't read shit. Actually, you know what? It's in the DMG. Fuck this guy. Eh. I don't think they mentioned that in the player's handbook. Then again, I probably would have read the DMG... Whatever. I got screwed. Whatever. That's... It's a story. He got better. He... I mean, it's shit. He was younger, too. But, uh... You know, we all get better. Um... He actually is a, a big fan of GURPS now. Uh, GURPS is a different game. Um... I actually really like GURPS, too. But not... I can't think of a single other person who plays it other than my brother. And he actually got a group together. A very good one, too. Um... But GURPS is behind a lot of... Really cool games and supplements. Very cool. But yeah, uh, that was the only time I really remember Doug just outright screwing me on a on a rule there. It was pretty bullshit. But um, I exploded, so there's that. Now, um, I have seen cases of players trying to exploit this. Because, let's say you have like two crummy potions or you find potions you don't know what they are in a dungeon. You could maybe weaponize them. Because, hell... There's a 3% chance that you'll either cause a mighty explosion or a cloud, a 10-foot diameter cloud of lethal, instantly lethal, toxic gas. Hell, it couldn't hurt. You know, if, you've, if your arch enemy is on the other side of the room and you got two potions, eh! 
stick them in your hand and throw them. It might hit the wall and be a frigging grenade. Or nothing. Or just start chugging potions. Maybe you, know, <laughs> maybe you get something you know permanent. Or like in the Cure Light Wounds, maybe those hit points are permanent. That could have been really cool. Or in the case of Neutralized Poison, maybe I become immune to poison. That could have easily happened. So, who knows? But no, that didn't happen. Instead, you could have buried what was left of Lance Storm Shield in a bucket. If it didn't, if it hadn't killed pretty much everybody but one of the other party party members, they were killed when Lance Storm Shield exploded, killed by shrapnel from my own destroyed ribs, and shame. Weird rule. I want to bring it back because that's the way it should be. There should be a sense of wonder in uh, mixing potions. Now, I know a lot of people are ask are kind of asking. Well, I mean, cure poison and cure light wounds. I would think the effect is fairly well known if that causes explosions, right, Spoonie? No, because think about this: every mage is different. You know, everyone has their own formula. There's not, you can't buy a book, or you can't buy like a cookbook that has, this is the recipe for cure light wounds. You know, this is the recipe for a neutralized poison. Now you could argue like, well, it's commonly known that maybe nightshade is, you know, in a neutralized poison spell, and it always is. You could be right. Because after all, the, the material components of the spells are the same for everybody. But every mage is different and they all put their own spin on things. Maybe their proportions are different. Maybe the, you know, everyone casts a different kind of spell. Even if the effects are the same, they have a different way of approaching it. You know, maybe he didn't say every single little syllable exactly right, but basically he said them. So maybe the casting of the, you know, the, you still have to enchant the potion. Maybe that's a little different. And the way it's prepared could easily be different. Seriously, these potions are potentially hundreds of years old. So maybe age has had something to do with it the chemical mix-up of these things is not always ever really going to be perfectly identical because it varies from wizard to wizard, as will the enchantment or the type of magic used. You don't know. So even potions that are kind of known quantities are not known quantities to you because each potion is different and they may interact differently. Now this was bullshit, admittedly, but it, it was... Even I, I was going to say, but it wasn't that bullshit. I mean, but if you're going to have it be that way for some potions, it should be that way for all of them. And besides, you could have gotten some really crazy friggin' wizard who put his own cat pee, cat pee in this Cure Light Wounds potion. Why? Because he thought cat pee would work. But apparently cat pee really does not fucking mix with the neutralized poison spell and it causes one of the most catastrophic explosions ever to rock the world. Could be. So maybe there's extraneous ingredients in the potion that really, really does not mix well. That's why. So I actually really like the potion missability result, even though it screwed me. Because really good things can happen, and it also adds a sense of wonder and fear to magic. And that's something I think is really missing from mages these days, especially 4th edition. And I like 4th edition, but it made wizards and magic users way less special in my view, because now everyone has spells, even people who don't have spells. Fighters don't attack things, they have little cards that have powers on them, so they're essentially casting spells, even if it involves hitting them with a sword. It's all, it's it's like an MMO, so where you don't have, I hit with sword, I have, you know, uh, rousing smite, or fury of the god, you know, fury of the god hammer, instead of just hitting them with a hammer. It's basically a spell. But but wizards, I always felt, should be mysterious. Nobody should really know how they work. You know, there's a sense of wonder to them. So when you get a magic potion, wow, that's really cool. But there may be a sense of fear to it, because even if you know what it is, oh, I don't try to drink too many of these, I, there's a risk. Very small risk, but there's a risk. Um, you could easily adapt this table to your own purposes to make it more or less fatal, or maybe lead to, maybe have a wider range be, you know, nothing bad happens results, whatever. But um, I really liked how, I really liked how, uh, it, I really how this version set it up. And to think that they cut it out when so many other rules, which I'm going to get to, stayed in, well, 
think it I think it took some of the magic out of magic. And some really, really funny, spontaneous human explosions. But hey, that's why we have house rules. You can bring back any kind of spontaneous human combustion that you want. I would try to make sure that Cure Light Wounds potions don't cause such things to happen. Because, well, I guess if nothing else, maybe maybe uh, the death of Lance Storm Shield will serve as inspiration or warning to those of you who go about cheesing potions. Hey, don't drink too many. Who knows what magic will do to you? It's a, it's a wild and uncertain force. It should not be taken lightly. Poor Lance.